In this video, I'm going to show you how to install vinyl siding that's made by CertainTeed. And if you're new to this channel, my name is Josh. The channel is all about DIY to save a ton of money. So be sure to subscribe, ring that bell so you get a notification every time I release a new video, and hammer that like button for me. That's all I ask for in turn for making this video. So we got a lot to go over today, so let's get started. I would like to thank CertainTeed for sponsoring this video. The siding that CertainTeed sent me to install in this video was the seven inch reinforced Serta plank that has a real wood look to it that has a nice grain finish. So it can almost be mistaken as real wood if you don't look close enough. And it's reinforced, meaning that we have this nice foam backing that keeps it more rigid and actually adds a little bit of R value to the siding. So that's a great perk to it. And this is castle stone color. It's the same color that I installed on my house. We're gonna get started on this Serta plank. So let's get to it. Before I begin installing the actual Serta planks themselves, I must first install all of the posts, the J channel, the starter strips, the E blocks, all the trim blocks before I start installing the planks themselves. With that being said, I'm gonna start with the three quarter inch outside corner post. And these are just like the corner post I installed in my last vinyl siding video. And just so you know, any of the three quarter inch trims will work with the Serta planks. So we're gonna go ahead and start on this post right here. Before installing the corner post, I like to chalk a three inch line going up each side of the corner in order to give me a reference guide to nail off the corner post because you want your corner post plumb and true to the corner. So I find it best to chalk a line. Some people just eyeball it, but for me it works great to have a reference line going up each side of the corner. So in order to do so, I just take a speed square and a pencil or marker and then start at the bottom here and I'm just gonna mark three inches and then mark three inches at the top, then chalk a line down each side. Depending on your soffit return and how your design is for your overhang is going to determine how it's gonna be cut to end the post at the top. So with this design, I need to cut my corner post to go around this bird box. This is what's called a bird box for this soffit return. And in order to do so, I gotta get the measurements off that chalk line in order to cut around this. And this side has a cut, then this side is just gonna be square. So the other side is gonna be very easy. I'm first gonna begin at the top of the corner where I gotta put the angle for the roof. I know that roof is gonna be a 712. So with that being said, I know I need to go to the common seven here on my speed square. And then I'm going to put the pitch of the roof onto the corner. I now know I need to come down seven and an eighth for the offset. So I'm simply just going to put a square line right here on this side of the post. And I know it's two inches of material I need left on the post here. So I'm going to come up to the two inch mark and then just put two inch line right here. And then I'm just gonna square over at that seven and an eighth. And I know this all needs cut out and this is what's gonna be left on to go around that bird box. I'm now just gonna take my 10 snips and cut that out. I'm now gonna dry fit the corner to make sure it fits well before cutting the bottom. This is the Serta starter strip. And with this starter strip, if I line this groove up at the bottom of the sill right here where it meets the foundation where I'm going to be installing it, I know that puts me about an inch past the foundation for the overhang. I want the corner to extend past the edge of the starter strip about three quarters of an inch. So I know from the foundation down, I need to measure an extra inch and three quarter to the post length in order to get my total length of the corner. My measurement is 121 and about a half inch. So if I add an inch and three quarter to that, that gives me 123 and a quarter. I'm gonna hook my tape right on the square cut of the post and come down to 123 and a quarter, which is right there. Now I'm gonna cut this off square like so. And now I'm gonna not cut this to seal off the bottom. And now I'm gonna seal off the bottom on this other corner 
for the pavilion that I'm going to show in this video. But this, there's really no reason to seal the bottom of this. So I'm not going to do it here. But again, I'm going to show you that here later. I'm going to be using inch and a half galvanized nails. Aluminum nails are fine as well for this siding installation. I'm now going to lift my corner up and hold it to that chalked line. And now I'm going to hold this up to where there's a 16th inch gap from the top. And I'm going to nail it at the top of a nail hole in order to hold it into place. And again, when you drive your nails, you don't want to drive them tight. You want to give it room so this can shift around and expand and contract properly. So as you can see, it can still move around. Now we nail this every 8 to 12 inches down each side of the post. And when I nail the rest of these, I'm going to nail right in the center of the nailing slot. And do the same to the other side of the corner. For this corner post, I got to cut it a little bit different. As you can see, we got this beam coming in to intersect the garage right here. So I'm going to cut the post to come up and stop within an inch from the top of the beam because I'm going to J-channel across that to transition from the PVC board to the vinyl siding. So with that being said, I'm just going to cut the post off square here and inform around this beam. It's a little different corner post than one we just did, but it's a similar concept. More or less, we shape around this beam. If we take a measurement, as you can see, if we leave on about an inch of this face, it's going to cover up the beam and give it a nice finished look. You'll understand more in here in just a moment, but I just want to show you how I'm going to get this measurement for the cutout. I'm first just going to square right off the total height in which I need to make this post. And then, like I just mentioned, we need to leave on one inch of material. So we're going to take our speed square, and then we're just going to mark one inch here. So we know that's how much we need to leave on. I'm going to square my line right across there. And I need to come down 10 and an eighth from that mark. So I'm going to burn an inch. And then we'll make our distance down. So that puts us right here. Now I know I need to go 3 quarters of an inch to make up for the thickness of the PVC board underneath. And then when you go about a quarter, then that's going to be the bottom of the beam. Now I'm just going to take my 10 snips and cut this out. And just like the other corners, I'm going to chalk a line three inches off the corners in order to come down nice and square. Now this corner here, we're gonna do a little different. If we place this corner up here where I'm gonna have it wrap the corner of this outdoor kitchen, as you can see, we got this beam here. So we're gonna to have to cut this to stop. So when the J channel comes over, it's gonna be flush with the bottom of it. Now I'm gonna close the underneath part of this corner. So in order to do that, I need to get my length and then add three quarters of an inch in order to fold it under and rivet it. And I'm gonna show you that now. Here's the mark for the bottom of the corner. And like I said, I'm gonna go past three quarters of an inch. So right here. Now I know I need to cut that off square. And now I need to cut everything off of the back of this from this point and all of this nailing flange in order to be able to fold this. And with that being said, I'm also going to cut just a little notch here. So if I take my speed square and I come over three quarters of an inch up, that's going to hit us right here where we want our true bottom. So I'm just going to cut right here off the corner of this so we can fold it. And then, like I said, I'm going to cut all this off from underneath. And now, as you can see, we need to fold this over in order to make the bottom seal. I'm now going to take my pliers and just fold this back onto itself to close up this bottom. 
Now in order to keep this together, I'm just going to hold it at the proper angle where it's supposed to be, then pop rivet this together. And that's going to give us a nice sealed look from the bottom. Now going to install what's called J channel around all the doors. The windows already have what's called J channel on them because these are new construction so I don't have to wrap my new construction windows in the J channel. But as you see here, the door has just brick mold around it just like the garage door opening. So we're going to have to wrap that in the J channel and anywhere where we installed the F channel for the soffit in the last video. We got to butt the J channel up to that to conceal the cut edges of the siding. In order to wrap this garage door opening with the J channel, I must first install the J channel on the sides and then the top. So in order to do that, because my brick mold runs cleared down to the concrete, I'm just going to run the J channel clear down along the side of the brick mold. So with that being said, I got to get a total measurement up to the top of this door. And then I got to add an inch to allow the trimming of the J channel. 97 and three quarters, so we're gonna cut it 98 and three quarter. I'm gonna mark 98 and three quarter on the J channel. And then after I do so, I'm gonna take my speed square and mark a square line right around the J channel. Now I'm just gonna cut that off. I'm now just going to come down an inch on this back side and then we're going to cut this out. Now as you can see we have this cut out to give a place for our top piece to fold into. You'll understand more in just a moment. I'm now going to take the J channel and place it up against the brick mold and then we're going to line it up to that one inch mark that we made down from the top so we have a one inch face sticking up past the top of the garage brick mold. And now we just loosely nail this to where we have some play, just like we nail all of the vinyl products. To measure this last piece across the top of the garage door, I must hook to the end of the J channel that's going up the side and then we get our measurement clear to the edge and that's 49 and an eighth. And then I got to add an inch for an overlap cut. So I'm going to cut it 50 and one eighth inch. In order to cut the end that's going to overlap to that previous piece, I must first measure over one inch. Then I'm going to mark the very top of the lip here. And then I'm going to come on the nailing flange and do the same thing measure over an inch. And now I'm going to take my 10 snips and cut this little lip off the J channel like so. And then we're going to get that off there by finishing the cut. Now I'm going to cut right down the nailing flange part. And we're going to cut that off. And now when we overlap, the face is going to have coverage in the bottom. Now we measure 50 and eighth off here and go make our 45. So I'm going to flip this around. I'm going to go ahead and cut this off here. And again, 45. Now we're going to install this on top of that door. So this overlap cut will simply slide into the previous piece like so and that's going to give us our joint and it's going to cover up very nicely and then we lap our 45 on the other side just like we did the previous piece now we nail it off just like we did the other pieces as you can see that 45 turned out really nice as well if we look over here at the overlap, that turned out great too. I'm now going to place J channel around this entry door. And it's the same principles as the big garage door, except when we cut the top piece, it's just going to be one piece with a 45 on each end. I'm now going to cut the piece of J channel to go across the top. In order to do so, I just got a hook on one side of the J channel and come over to the edge of the other. And I got 42 inches. And now with that being said, 
You could also just measure from the brick mold to brick mold and add two inches. And then we're going to bend this over and this is going to create what's called a rain tab so water will come down the J channel and run down the side of the doors J channel. And now with that being said, we got to measure over that 42 inches and then do the same to the other end. I'm now going to install the top piece of J channel to where the rain tab will go into the side of the J channel and then this part's going to overlap this part of the previous J channel. So we're going to loop that in there now. So as you can see, that gives you a nice 45 degree look. And now when the water comes down, hits this J channel, it's going to run down this side of the J channel, then to the ground. I now got to install J channel right here along the F channel. With that being said, as you know, this is a 712 roof. So I got to put a 712 in order to meet this corner that we installed earlier, and then run up towards the gable. I'm now going to install the J channel going across the top of the beam and then the J channel going up against the F channel. So with that being said, I'm going to chalk a line 12 inches up off the bottom of this beam. So 12 inches up puts me about right here and that's going to be the top of my J channel's nailing flange because I don't want to get any chalk down here where you might see it. So I, got a so I kept it up out by the way. So I'm going to chalk the line and install the J channel from that post that we did here at the beam clear to the other post. I'm now going to install the electrical boxes anywhere where I have a light or a receptacle on the outside. And along with this black receptacle box, I also got what's called a universal mounting block. So it's going to be a two-piece setup here. We're first going to install the electrical box, and then we're going to trim around it with the universal mounting block. And the universal mounting block is very simple. It simply has a spot here in which the electrical box will be placed and it's just a trim kit. So after you install the siding around it, you're gonna snap this back over it in order to trim around it. With the CertainTeed universal mounting block, if you open it up, as you can see on the back, we got a square section that's meant for the receptacles and then a circular section that you would cut out for the lights. So that way you can have a nice cover and you can still use it for both applications. So we're going to install this now. This is the electrical box I'm going to be installing. And if you take the front of it off, as you can see, we got the pass-through clips here. That's what I like to use to secure my wires. And there's also some knockouts as well. And these holes in the back are meant for the spacers that come with the box. And they just slide right into these holes first. And that's going to be a nice little feature to help if the wall's not perfectly flat. It's going to give you a little room there for movement. This is going to be for lights and for receptacles. So this box can be used for both, which is very nice. And then after you get it put together and the wires through, we can put this cover back on. And each side here has these black spacers for the universal mounting block to be spaced correctly around the box. So this is what I'm going to be using for this installation. And I made a video when I was wiring this garage showing these. If you want to check out that video, check out the video link at the top right hand corner of the screen. And I'll walk you through how I wired the garage. In order to install the electrical box, I'm first going to take the cover off. And I'm going to use the pull through clips here. 
So I'm gonna fish my wire right over that. And obviously before you install this, you would confirm the power is off to this circuit. And now with that pushed through all the way, we're tight against the building. And we're gonna install a screw right here in the bottom corner to anchor next to the wire first. And we could also use this pull through clip as well but it would send my receptacle lower and I want to keep it at this height. I'm going to use an exterior wood screw in order to secure the box to the building. And again, I'm going to use the spots that are designed for the screws. Now that I got one screw next to the wire, I'm just going to use a level. You can use a torpedo level here, but I just happen to have a two foot level with me. We're going to level the box up really well. And that looks good. And now I'm going to place a screw in this opposing corner. Now I'm going to finish off the box by putting a screw in the last two corners. I'm now going to take the universal mounting block cover off and I'm going to fish it over the wire. And now I'm going to mark where I need to cut my house wrap. And you can see right here to here so we can fish it over this J block. And I'd like for you to note the black tabs on each side of the electrical box. That's going to space this mounting block appropriately around that electrical box. So if we fish this over, we're going to slide this up under the house wrap like so. And that's going to help give us a nice weatherproof barrier and allow the water to go down the sides. And now with it spaced appropriately, we're going to place a nail in each corner and one on each flat. I'm now going to use flashing tape to flash around the box. And now that our box is flashed, we can replace the box cover like so. And then this trim piece is going to snap over after I place the siding around the J block like so. And now with that being said, this needs cut out for a receptacle and I'm going to show you how to do that. So we'll snap this on officially once the siding's on. In order to cut this out for a receptacle, if we flip it around, it's going to be this square right here. And again, if it feels for a light, it'd be this circular cutout. And with that being said, you can usually use a utility knife, press down in here and cut it out like so. Or you can use an oscillating tool to cut it out. I like the oscillating tool, it just seems to be a little easier for me to do. So I'm going to cut out that square. And now as you can see, it's going to be the perfect trim piece for the receptacle. very important piece to installing vinyl siding is installing some kind of water barrier on top of the sheathing or OSB on your building. And the reason why that is siding is not perfectly waterproof in a sense of water goes around windows behind the siding in some spots. So you need to make sure there's some kind of water barrier here. Certainty makes a certain wrap that would be in replacement of this house wrap but i happen to have house wrap on this building so that's going to act as the water barrier so i just wanted to let you know that before we get started and also you need to make sure you flash around your windows and objects that are similar to that for the same exact reason and if you want to see how i flashed around this window and installed it check out the video link at the top right hand corner of the screen i go step by step on installing this window and flashing it now that i got the vinyl corners on j channel the electrical boxes and all the trims on this building i'm now going to install the starter strip because it's time to get ready to start running the planks and now with that being said this certain teed certa plank has its own starter strip 
This is not your standard starter strip that's going to be used for all vinyl sidings. This is only for the Serta plank. The nailing flange on this is two and a half inches, and that's important to know for the next step. In order to start the starter strip, I must first chalk a level line across the bottom of the building. Now, with that being said, we know the nailing flange on that starter strip is two and a half inches, and we're going to have an inch overhang, and the total length or the total width of that starter strip is three and a half inches. So I'm just going to put my tape measure here right where the sill plate is on top of the foundation, and I'm just going to measure up two and a half inches here. So I know right here is going to be the top of my starter strip and something very important to know is the lowest point of your building because if you start at the high point of your building and yes not every building is perfectly level so it wouldn't hurt to shoot grade at each corner just to double check but I just built this building and I know we're really good so I can start here because all the corners are the same in this case so now I'm going to go over here to the other side and measure up two and a half inches off the block as well. I'm now going to come over here where the starter strip's going to end and it happens to be right against this garage door and I'm going to measure up two and a half inches off the foundation and make a mark. I'm now going to place a nail here to hold my chalk line. I'm now going to hook my chalk line to it and run it over to the previous mark we made. I'm now going to pull it tight against that mark and snap my line. If you ever question if your chalk line is not level or not, just take a four foot level and place it on your freshly chalked chalk line and double check. And if you're level with your four foot level, then you should be good to go. And as you can see, right there is on the line and we are sitting perfectly level in this case. It's always important to do this now before you get siding up the wall and then realize you're not level and then you got to start over. I'm now going to take a full piece of starter strip and line the chalk line up with the top of the starter strip and then nail it every 8 to 10 inches in the nail holes provided. It is recommended that you leave a half inch gap between the starter strip and the corner to allow for expansion and contraction. When I nail the starter strip on, I like to alternate between the nail holes at the top and the nail holes at the bottom, just so it evenly distributes the anchoring power. When I install the next piece of starter strip, I don't butt it tight like that. We need to leave about a quarter inch gap, right like that, in order to allow room for expansion and contraction. So I'm going to nail it right in the place there. I now got to cut a little piece here to finish up. If you take a measurement and tight up against the nailing flange of the J channel and subtract a quarter inch, I need about a three inch piece to finish up. The starter strip is easy to cut with 10 snips, just like we were using to cut the other vinyl products. I'm now going to nail this on and again leaving a quarter inch in between the pre-existing piece. I'm now going to use that same method to go around this whole building and install the rest of the starter strip. It's now time to begin installing the beautiful Serta planks. Now something really important that I like to do, which may or may not be important to you, but to me it is, whenever I pull into my driveway, which is pointing this way, I like to start my siding from the opposite end, so when the overlaps happen, whenever you're looking down the wall, you won't notice the overlap as much if the overlap is running this way if you're looking this way. So that's an important part that I like to consider when starting my installation. So with that being said, I'm going to start here in this bottom corner. Before starting, I wanted to show you the anatomy, if you will, of this Serta plank. First, I'd like to point out you have these 
labeled nail slots that are labeled with the alphabet. We got E R S T U D F I N D E R. So that stud finder is what it spells out. But the reason why this is called stud finder is because they are spaced 16 inches apart. So if your stud hits on a U, so to speak, you're going to nail the next U to be 16 on center, which is the most common layout of a stud wall. And then you got your channel that's going to get covered up by the next piece of siding's bottom channel. So this back, let me turn it over here. So this back is going to lock into the front here so that's how the channels interlock with each other and also each factory end has a cutout so they can overlap properly and this certain one since it's reinforced has the foam backing so that's one thing i noticed that i really like about the serta plank already is that it's much more stable than the standard vinyl siding so i just want to point out some of the basics before we get started. Something that's significantly different when installing the Serta plank that you're gonna to have to do is whichever end is going to be overlapped because as I just mentioned, we're gonna be overlapping this side of the panel. We must first remove this before the next piece overlaps it. So with that being said, I'm gonna take my speed square and just come back inch and a half, which happens to be flush with this nailing flange and then I'm gonna snip that off with my snips. And again, this is something that's gonna to have to be done where there is an overlap, and yes, there are a lot of overlaps when installing this. I'm now gonna begin installing the first piece onto the starter strip by hooking the bottom channel onto the starter strip like so, and you'll feel it once it's secure in the starter strip. And now as far as how much of a gap to leave at the ends where they butt to the other trims, you want to leave a quarter inch gap whenever it's above 40 degrees. And whenever it's below 40 degrees, you want to leave 3 8 inch of a gap because it's going to expand more after it warms up. So that's an important concept to know. So now I'm going to hold tension up on this once I'm looped into the starter really well. And I'm going to nail it right in the middle to hold it into place. Now that there's a nail holding it into place while I position the gap correctly, so again, I'm gonna just pull it out a quarter inch, about like so, because it is 50 degrees right now. And now I'm gonna nail right in the middle of the nailing slot within a couple inches of the end. And again, you want it to be nailed loosely like so. I now got to do what's called center pinning of this Serta plank. It's where I come to the exact center of the panel, which is right here. And I got to place a nail that's about an eighth inch from each end of the nailing slot in order to control the expansion and contraction so it all looks good long term. So I'm going to start right here with this one and drive it just like I would any other vinyl siding nail. Again, we still loose nail it just like so. And we install another nail in the same nailing slot, but right here at the other end. And again, you wanna leave just a little bit of space to the edge there, about an eighth inch. And it doesn't have to be on a stud here. We gotta do this with every piece of Serta plank. Now that this piece is center pinned, we are ready to start nailing it off. And we're going to nail it every 16 inches again on center using the stud finder system. Now the first thing I'm going to do is locate my first stud. So I'm just going to take my hammer and peck on the wall. And it sounds like we got a stud right here at the end. And just to verify, I'm going to come to the next end to make sure I have one there. Yep, we can tell there's one there for sure. So we're going to drive a nail right in the center of this nailing slot. And we got a nail on each end on the stud finder system. Now that I got a nail on each stud for this piece of siding, even though there's not a stud here at the end at this last nailing slot, I'm going to still put a nail here to secure the end. I'm now going to measure and cut this piece that's going to overlap the first piece we just installed. Something really important to know 
If it's greater than 40 degrees outside, you want a one inch overlap on this piece of siding. And if it's less than 40 degrees, you only want three quarters of an inch overlap onto this siding. And now with that being said, when it comes to expansion and contraction, the first rule that I applied earlier, we want three eighths of an inch if it's below 40 degrees from that J channel. And if it's above 40 degrees, we want only a quarter inch. So now that we got that out of the way, we're gonna get a measurement. I'm gonna pull off the end that's gonna overlap the siding and measure up to the part that's gonna be cut that's gonna go behind the J channel. So I'm gonna take my speed square and square right down and make a square line for my cut. And I'm just gonna take my 10 snips and cut right down the whole piece of siding. And you can also use the miter saw method with the blade turned backwards like I did installing the soffit on this building. I'm now gonna take the cut piece and overlap the piece to where it slides over the first piece we just installed and snap it together like so and onto the channel. Now we're gonna to come to the center here and do the pinning method. Now that we're pinned, we're gonna locate our stud. And now we are on the T for our 16 on center. And that was great because it's actually right next towards the end, which I always put a nail in the first nailing slot where it overlaps as well. So now we just nail all the T's. And our first row is done on this section of the wall. I'm now gonna take the remaining piece of the last piece we just cut and remove the inch and a half like I mentioned, and then continue the run. I'm now gonna take this and snap it onto the previous row we just installed. We simply just take this channel that's on the back and snap it into the channel that's on the previous row like this. Line it up and then pull up. All right, you feel it lock in. Then once it's locked in, just keep a little tension on it so it doesn't fall out. And then center nail it just like we did the last row. Now we overlap and continue the runs. Now I'm going to show you how to easily mark and cut around one of these universal mounting blocks or any mounting block for that matter. I'm first going to lay my piece of siding into the J channel then pull it back to its proper expansion which is a quarter inch right there and then I'm going to mark a quarter inch from each side of this mounting block to cut it out and again depending on the temperature it might have to be three eighths but right now it's a quarter inch. And now that I have that marked, I'm just going to measure up and add a quarter inch to go up above it. So it looks like about seven inches up off this. I'm now just going to take my speed square and square up seven inches, which happens to be this whole piece like so. So the only thing that's going to be left is the flange up here for the next piece to lap onto and I'm just going to cut this out with my tin snips. And something that's a big help is an oscillating tool. You can easily go in here and cut that out, especially when you're cutting over these heavy gauge flanges. You can cut through it easy with the oscillating tool. Now we're going to install that right over the mounting block. Now that we got the siding installed around our mounting block, we're just gonna take the trim cover and place right over it. And as you can see, that gives it a really nice finished look. So I highly recommend the universal mounting blocks as an electrical box combo. I'm now gonna show you how to install a piece around the bottom of a window. I'm first gonna take the next row and slide it right up to the window and get my gap correctly from the corner. 
and then I'm going to mark a quarter inch from each side of the window, not from the J-channel part, but from the inside of the J-channel. And that's going to give us our exact measurement. I'm now going to mark the quarter inch from each side of the window. I'm going to take this off. I'm now going to take my tape measure and push it up into the bottom of the window's J-channel and measure down to the lip. And we got about three inches, so we should track the quarter. So we got to come up two and three quarters inch and cut around the window. Right here's one mark and right here's the other. I'm just going to take my speed square, place it up against the bottom of the siding, line it up with the mark we just made, which is right here. Come up two and three quarter and then make a square line up. And then we're going to slide our speed square at the two and three quarter mark to mark the rip. Now we know we got to cut this section out. Then we simply cut it out just as if we were to cut the straight cuts and then cut that. And to show you the option, we can use the oscillating tool to make that rip as well. The oscillating tool works easier for me in a lot of cases. I'm now gonna flip this around and I'm gonna cut this foam off about an inch section of it in order to pad out my undersill trim. Now this is gonna work as our padding. I now got a piece of the undersill trim here and I'm just gonna line it up with that cutout and just stay back about a half inch from each edge and then cut that. I'm now going to take my snap lock tool and make snap locks every six inches across the bottom of this piece of siding. Now I'm going to nail on this utility trim. I'm now going to take that scrap piece of foam and place it behind the utility trim and then I'm going to nail it right here under the window in order to secure it to underneath the window. So we just butt it up tight, space it evenly. And now we're going to install this piece of siding to snap into that undersill trim. Alright, so now as you can see after it's snapped into that undersill, it gives it a nice finished look and it's locked in to where it's definitely not going to blow out of there in this case. Two pro tips I'd like to mention while installing the vinyl siding. The first one would be to measure down each side of the door and window as you go across to make sure each row is lining up with the row that's on either side of the window or door. And also I like to check with a level just to make sure we're staying level as we run, especially if you have two people running it together because if one person pulls up more tension than the other, it could start running out of level. I'm now at a point on the wall where I'm getting ready to enter the gable. So I gotta cut angles on the rest of these until we get to the peak. An easy way to get the angle is to take a scrap piece and lay it right on top of the nailing flange and then take another scrap piece and slide it up into the J channel. And then right here where they overlap is the angle transcribed from the gable. So I'm simply gonna mark this with my pencil now I got a template I can use to cut the rest of the angles up this side of the gable. Now that I got the angle transcribed onto a scrap piece of siding, I can take my speed square and pivot right where the angle intersects the bottom of the siding. And we can check our degree here. And our degree in this case is about a 60 degree angle. So we can transcribe that angle onto the miter saw so we can cut these perfect or we can simply just cut this with snips and save this end as a template to cut our other angles. I'm here at the miter saw and just so you know the miter saw might not be able to get steep enough depending on the pitch of your roof. So in this case it is able to get to our 60 with this saw. So right here is our angle and if you can't cut this with a miter saw you obviously would just use the template and cut it with the snips but as you can see we got it lined up well and that's the right angle. So we're gonna cut this with the miter saw. 
I'm now just going to finish the cut with the snips. But as you just seen, it got majority of the cut done, which is really nice. And that's going to snap into place and give us a nice angle. Again, this was a scrap, but I can take this as a template and just slide it onto a piece in order to mark the angle like so. So now we'll save this for those instances. And now that I'm on the topic of cutting the siding with the miter saw, I just wanted to show you the actual blade and what I'm using. I'm using a fine tooth blade turned around backwards. So when it spins, it doesn't cut right through it with the rigid teeth. It will actually spin to where the dull part is hitting the siding. So I like to use that method. So as you can see, you always got to use ear protection, eye protection because it's really loud. So it makes really nice square cuts. So whenever I can, I use the miter saw method, but the snips work just as well if you don't have one. For the first piece going up the gable, I got to measure up three and a half inches because we still got a straight run here on the side. And then that three and a half inch mark is where I'm going to start the angle. So I'm going to take my saw, get it lined up here. Another key when using the miter saw is to cut slow. To cut fast, it has a tendency to want to crack it. So cut slow, and if it's warmer out, it'll cut better as well. For the piece of siding that goes in the peak, I just pre-start one of the stainless steel nails in it, and that's the trim nail that we use on the soffit to finish up the siding. As you can see, that nail is hidden behind the J-channel, and that's a nice finished peak. What do you think of the siding? I love it. You like it? Uh, no, I love it. Oh, yes. it does look did good, great. doesn't it? I'm loving it as well. Now going to finish up where the wall meets the soffit here at the top. In order to do this, the first thing we got to do is measure right up from up in top of the J channel down to the lip of the siding. So we got about four inches. So now I got to subtract a quarter inch. So I need to rip down a piece of siding three and three quarters inch, just like we did underneath the windows. Because it was getting cold outside and the siding was more fragile because of that, I actually brought it inside of the garage and hooked the heater up to work with it. And as you can see, a putty knife works great for removing the foam off the back of the siding 
just FYI and also we just cut it like normal as far as the overlaps and everything else just like we would each run. I'm now going to take the foam that came out from behind the siding that we ripped out. We're going to install this up in here first just like we did underneath of the windows. And I'm just going to tack it into place with a nail for now. I'm now going to install the undersill trim just like we did underneath of the windows. I'm now going to nail the undersill trim on every 10 inches or so. I'm now going to take the piece that we ripped down and prepared and install it right into that undersill trim just like we did under the windows. And that's how you finish up along the top of the wall. As you can see, that siding finished up beautifully across the top, looks really good. So now I'm going to show you how to transition around a corner when there's no starter strip to go off of. Unlike the other corner where we were coming up the wall, we had a starter strip. But in this case, as you can see, we can go around this corner if we have the same reveal of the siding. So a simple way to do that is take a speed square and we're going to line it up with the bottom of this last or the first row of siding up off the J channel. And then we're going to make a mark right here on the corner. And then we're going to transcribe that mark over to this side of the corner. So now we know that's exactly where the lap should line up at. And then we can just transcribe that onto the wall. And then we'll just lay a piece up here as a reference to show where the nailing flange top is. So we know all we gotta do is get that same measurement off the J channel on the other side of the wall and chalk a line. And that's gonna be the start of our row. And as you can see, we gotta rip this down for our starter. Because this J channel is on the gable end, it's gonna have a lot of water hitting the J channel and coming down. I gotta have a place to, for the water to weep out of. So I gotta put weep holes in the bottom of this J channel. I'm just gonna take an eighth inch drill bit every two foot or so across the bottom of this J channel. Up underneath, I'm gonna drill a hole so the water can weep out and it won't freeze and crack your J channel. So that's another risk of why you want the water to come out of the J channel. As you can see, the Serta plank turned out very nice. And if you want to check out any of the Certainty products, I'll put a link to their website in the description below. There you will find all their products they offer, along with any additional information that you need to know. And also, I offer channel memberships. So if you want to join the channel memberships, you'll get exclusive content, you'll get access to our Discord group, and you'll also get live streams every month. If you would like to know how I installed all of this soffit and fascia, check out this video. It'll help you out. <laughs>